Tonight, Middle East devastation. Israel continues fire after hitting Hezbollah targets in the deadliest attack in two decades as thousands are fleeing southern Lebanon. MPOX fears. First case of Clade 1B strain detected in India, authorities heightened surveillance and health protocols. Industrial Renaissance. Trump calls for taking other nations' companies but lays out few specifics and pledges to appoint a global manufacturing ambassador. And Kindness for Free, a donation-based store in New York offering those in need everything from clothes, services and support to asylum seekers. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Other Than a World News Tonight. A very good evening and welcome to World News Tonight. We've got lots of key stories to bring to you from across the globe and we begin with the ongoing tensions in Israel. In the deadliest day of conflict there in almost 20 years, Israel and Hezbollah traded fire again yesterday, including a new Israeli airstrike on Beirut. The death toll from a massive Israeli bombardment climbed to nearly 560 and thousands fled from southern Lebanon, with the two sides on the brink of all-out war. As ambulances rush to Beirut southern suburbs, a crowd gathers to inspect the damage. Moments earlier, this building was hit by an Israeli airstrike, blowing out its windows and scattering rubble. The Israeli military said it had carried out a targeted strike in Beirut without giving details. Hezbollah said Ali Karake, its third in command, was alive and had moved to safety after a source said the strike on the capital targeted him. It was part of wide-ranging Israeli strikes in Lebanon Monday, hitting districts like Sidon, Baalbek and Tyre. Authorities said hundreds were killed and thousands wounded in the attacks, making it the deadliest barrage since the 2006 Israel-Hezbollah war. The Israeli army claimed it inflicted heavy damage to the Iran-backed group. Hezbollah responded by firing hundreds of rockets towards Israel Monday. Footage showed projectiles being intercepted over Haifa by the Iron Dome. The militant group said it's acting in support of Hamas and will not stop until a ceasefire in Gaza. Israel wants to allow tens of thousands of Israelis displaced by cross-border fighting to return to their homes in the country's north. Meanwhile, highways in Lebanon were choked with traffic as thousands fled towards Beirut. The Lebanese government on Monday ordered schools and universities to close across much of the country and began preparing shelters for the displaced. International leaders have called for a de-escalation, the Biden administration insisting that getting a ceasefire deal between Israel and Gaza was key to easing tensions in the region. India has reported its first case with a new MPOX strain that has triggered a public health emergency alert by the World Health Organization. The new variant called Clade 1B is highly transmissible and linked to the MPOX outbreak in Africa. According to media reports, the strain has been detected in a 38-year-old man from the southern state of Kerala who returned from Dubai recently. MPOX, previously known as monkeypox, is a contagious virus that can cause painful skin lesions. The World Health Organization declared MPOX a public health emergency in Africa in August. Since then, the more dangerous variant of the virus has spread to countries outside the African continent, including Sweden, Thailand and Pakistan. Health Ministry spokesperson Manisha Verma confirmed that the MPOX case reported in Kerala's Malappuram district belonged to Clade 1. The authorities said that the patient is being treated in a hospital and the people he came in contact with are being traced and monitored. In the last two years, India has reported more than 30 MPOX cases caused by the older clay 2 strain, which is considered to be less infectious. Over in Singapore, the former Transport Minister S. Iswaran has pleaded guilty to receiving gifts while in office. The proceedings began yesterday in a rare graph trial involving a state official in this Asian financial hub. The case charges Subramaniam Iswaran, who goes by S. Iswaran, with receiving favours including tickets to English Premier League soccer matches and the Singapore Formula One Grand Prix. Iswaran, who joined the cabinet in 2006, is the first full minister to be tried in court on graft charges in the wealthy city-state, which prides itself on having a well-paid and efficient bureaucracy, as well as strong governance. 
The 62-year-old was arrested in July last year, accused of taking kickbacks worth hundreds of thousands of dollars from property tycoon Ong Beng Seng and another businessman. Iswa Ran was advisor to the Grand Prix steering committee, while Ong owns the rights to the race. Ong has not been charged with any offense. Iswa Ran had rejected the allegations when he resigned from the cabinet. In court, he pleaded guilty to accepting gifts as a public servant, as well as to obstructing justice instead of charges that include corruption. In a surprise move, the prosecution dropped the vast majority of charges against Iswaran, and it asked for a sentence of up to seven months in prison, according to Channel News Asia. That's much lighter than the maximum of seven years and fines for obstructing justice, or the two years and fines for accepting gifts. The news outlet reported that Iswaran will be sentenced on October 3rd. The last corruption case involving a Singaporean minister investigated for allegedly accepting bribes was in 1986, but the man died before he could be charged in court. According to Transparency International's Corruption Perception Index, Singapore was among the world's top five least corrupt countries last year. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky told the United Nations Security Council that the war between Russia and Ukraine cannot be resolved by talks alone, but that Moscow must be forced into peace. And rules that he won't stop on his own. Russia can only be forced into peace. Ukraine faces an uncertain future. Right now, it relies heavily on U.S. military and financial support. A victory for former President Donald Trump over Vice President Kamala Harris in November's U.S. presidential election could prompt a reset of Washington's policy on Ukraine. Zelensky again mentioned a victory plan. He plans to show both candidates for ending the conflict. He has revealed little about it beyond saying it would lead to a second Ukraine-led summit for peace by the end of the year that Russia would be invited to. However, he has said that if his plan is backed by the West. It could significantly impact Moscow, including in a psychological way that could help compel Putin to end the war diplomatically. During the summit on Tuesday, Russian UN Ambassador Vasily Nebenzia spoke up to reject the 15-member council's hosting of Zelensky. There was also a clash between U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi over allegations of Chinese support for Russia's war efforts. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. On the road to the White House now, Donald Trump pledged to create special manufacturing zones on federal lands, offering incentives to encourage foreign companies to relocate to the U.S. if he wins the November 5th election. During his speech in Georgia, he also added that his Democratic rival is to blame for waiting too long to visit the borders and to take action against the current crisis. The Republican candidate made these remarks ahead of Vice President Kamala Harris's Arizona border visit. Donald Trump said during his speech in Georgia, the incentives, which include low taxes and few regulations, would be offered only to companies that relocated manufacturing to the U.S. and hired American workers. Further adding, Trump said he wanted German car companies to become American car companies and wanted them to build their plants in the U.S. soil. Companies that did not make their goods in the U.S., however, would face a very substantial tariff when sending their products into the United States. Trump was speaking in Savannah. Which has one of the largest ports in the U.S. and is a car manufacturing hub. Trump said he would reward U.S.-based manufacturers with tax breaks for research and development cost and the ability to write off the cost of heavy machinery in the first year. It is unclear what federal lands would be offered to foreign companies under Trump's plan or how such agreement would work. If land remains in federal hands while foreign companies operate on it, those companies could, in theory, be exempt from property tax. Trump also took aim at Vice President Kamala Harris' possible visit to the U.S.-Mexico border, reportedly scheduled on Friday. Trump accused Harris of waiting too long to address the border crisis. Trump blamed Kamala Harris, saying that finally she was going to the border for years, and it is a disgrace that she has waited too long.
Meanwhile, the US Justice Department plans to charge the man accused of hiding with a gun at former President Donald Trump's Florida golf course with attempting to assassinate the major political candidate. Persecutor said that if convicted, such a charge would carry a maximum penalty of life imprisonment. Federal authorities want to charge Ryan Routh, the man accused of hiding with a gun at Donald Trump's Florida golf course, with attempted assassination. If convicted, he could face life in prison. Routh was arrested on September 15th and appeared in court Monday for a hearing. He was handcuffed and shackled at the waist in front of U.S. Magistrate Judge Ryan McCabe. Their prosecutors claimed Routh wrote a letter months earlier referencing an assassination attempt on the Republican presidential candidate and a $150,000 bounty on his life. According to a court filing, several months prior to the incident, Routh dropped a box off at the home of an unidentified civilian witness. It contained a handwritten letter that said, This was an assassination attempt on Donald Trump, but I failed you. I will offer $150,000 to whomever can complete the job. A lawyer representing Routh argued that perhaps the letter was a publicity stunt. Prosecutors also said Routh's car contained a handwritten list of dates in August, September, and October of places where Trump had appeared or was expected to appear. They added Routh assembled a sniper's nest near the sixth hole of Trump's West Palm Beach golf course in an attempt to kill him, and was only stopped when a U.S. Secret Service agent opened fire. Routh so far has been charged with possession of a firearm as a convicted felon and possession of a firearm with an obliterated serial number. He has not yet entered a plea. After hearing from prosecutors, Judge McCabe ordered Routh to be detained without bond pending trial on the two gun-related charges. Trump in a statement Monday called Routh's charges inadequate, labeling them a slap on the wrist against a maniac assassin. The incident in Florida came two months after another gunman wounded Trump on the ear during a campaign rally in Butler, Pennsylvania. Moving on to Mexico, Tropical Storm Joan, which made landfall in Mexico's southern Pacific coast as a Category 3 hurricane, unleashed heavy rains as it moved inland, causing at least three deaths with dangerous levels of flooding expected. By Tuesday morning, the remnants of the storm brought strong winds and dumped heavy rain of over 250 millimetres on parts of Guerrero and Oaxaca, two of the poorest states in Mexico. Two people died after a mudslide buried a house while a woman was also killed when a wall collapsed on her house, with all three deaths reportedly occurring in Guerrero State. The storm made landfall as a Category 3 hurricane, with wind speeds of up to 200 km per hour on Monday, raising fears of a repeat of Hurricane Otis last October, which quickly transformed from a tropical storm into a Category 5 hurricane and devastated the coast of Oaxaca to Acapulco. Forecasters predict heavy rain of up to 500 millimetres through Thursday in the region, with a high risk of flash flooding and mudslides. Incoming Interior Minister Bruno Retaglio said on Monday that his priority would be to restore order as he took control of the Interior Ministry. Bruno Retaglio, a conservative senator known for his hard right views, called for a tougher stance on immigration in his first public statements, noting that the French people want more order, order in the streets, order at the borders. For his first official outing as Interior Minister, Bruno Retaillot said he wanted to show support to police officers. Visiting a station in the French capital's northern suburbs, Retaillot reiterated one of his priorities, reducing immigration. In his own words, naturalize as little as possible, but deport as much as possible. To reduce immigration in France, the new minister is considering a number of actions, including reforming state medical assistance, which guarantees free medical and hospital care to irregular migrants who've been in the country at least three months. Rutayo also wants to reinstate the offence of illegal residence abolished in 2012, as well as reverse certain agreements with Algeria. The minister says he's in favour of revoking a 1968 agreement that gives special status to Algerians in terms of movement, residence and employment in France. However, the treaty is governed by international law, not French law. Routayo's appointment and his initial statements have triggered an outcry from the left. One politician has even accused him of racism for past comments. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side.
Welcome back and finally tonight, the little shop of kindness in New York City's Upper East Side neighborhood, a boutique that offers free social services, legal advice and clothing for migrants. Every item in this store is free and given with a smile. Two years ago, Ilza Thilman was moved into action when governors started busing asylum seekers and migrants searching for the American dream to cities like Los Angeles, Chicago, Denver, Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, and New York. Store shelves are filled with donations. At Little Shop of Kindness, asylum seekers are connected with other families, directed towards available resources, and above all, treated with kindness. Thielman says this isn't about politics, it's about people. That is all we have for you tonight on World News. Tune in again tomorrow for more key updates from across the globe. Stay tuned as Sanvi Mudanayaka will join you shortly with the Nightly Business Report. Thank you for watching. Good night.